I'm going to talk today about cartridge case design, shape, and other things. Everybody that manufactures cartridge brass, they make brass in different ways. What I mean by different ways is that some brass is thicker at the neck, maybe thicker down near the head of the case. Some cartridge cases are thicker from the base of the case to the bottom of the internal capacity of the case. But basically the thicker case, if it's a harder case, is basically the strongest case. Thinner case is the weakest case in all those areas. And this doesn't necessarily mean that one's good and one's bad. It all depends on the application, the actual caliber, the actual size. There's a lot of difference between a 222 case, the thickness of the head, the thickness of the case walls, and one thing or another, in relationship to, say, a magnum case. Basically, our what is considered magnum case is a 300 H&H type case, 300 Weatherby case, 300 Winchester case. Those are all the same basic case. The same belt dimensions and one thing or another. The same head dimensions and so forth. Now, some manufacturers manufacture brass of a certain diameter at the the diameter at the belt. Some manufacturers manufacture cases with a different diameter at the belt. Mostly, the ones that are different diameter, a little smaller diameter. As a rule, the Remington case has a smaller diameter at the belt than, say, a Winchester case or perhaps a lot of other cases. There's other aspects to do with cases. Brass hardness. And years ago, I had the opportunity when I had an access to a Rockwell tester which would test, you know, hardness of steel or hardness of brass and using a using a different type of an anvil, use the B scale, the B scale for brass, the, the C scale for the hardness of steel. And I'm going to relate to you the different hardnesses of brass. Lapua, on the B scale, a hardness of 86. Federal, 87. RWS, 82. PMC, 86. Hornady, 87. IMI, 88. Norma, 90. Remington 93, Seiko 86, Spear 88, Winchester 88. Now, in all this brass, in all my extensive reloading experience, I have found there's aspects to brass, it's just simply tougher. I have found the RWS brass to very, be very tough. I have found the Lapua brass to be very tough. And those two brasses, RWS and Lapua, as a rule, the brass is a little bit thicker down at the head and the walls, the body walls down by the head and so forth. And perhaps even along the entire wall of the body of the case. Our DBS, of course, is made out of country. That's a German, that's a German made 
cartridge press. <coughs> and I have extensive experience with the 404 line of brass from RWS and considerable experience from the Lapua line of brass and this brass is absolutely wonderful brass. Not that there aren't other, bra other brass manufacturers that make excellent brass, but those two are just absolutely fantastic. As far as dimensional characteristics, the actual concentricity of the brass, the wall thickness around the, around the, around the case is very, very consistent. And this aids in accuracy. The thicker, tougher brass obviously will allow you to load to a little higher load than what you might some other brass. And however, with this in mind, there may be only, you know, less than a half grain or maybe less than a grain or so difference an actual load capability of the individual cases. If we had individual cases in all these various brass manufacturers line of brass, if we worked up loads all to the same pressure level, we would find that there would be different case head expansions and so forth at a different point in time. In relationship to charge weight. Now also cases have dimensional characteristics to do with the diameter of the primer pocket. That's why some primer seat considerably deeper than others. Not deeper but seat harder. It's harder to seat the primer in some cases than others because it's maybe a thousandth or so tighter than perhaps other brass that you may have used and you encounter now another brass and from lot to lot to lot they're, they're obviously everything has dimensional characteristics so don't expect the dimensional characteristics to be exactly the same it's going to be ex very very close as a rule because of chamber dimensions and one thing or another the tougher brass, it should be very obvious that this brass, in relationship to hardness, can be loaded to higher velocities in a specific case. So when you're comparing them, you don't compare one particular case, like for instance a 30-06 case and a Magnum case. Compare those if you're going to compare Compare magnum case to magnum case, hot six case to hot six case. And you see, the belted case came along with the idea that it gave you a different type of head space control and a little bit thicker back there, back there at the head portion of the case. And, but however, the portion of the case ahead of the belt is not any thicker. So all these things all depend and I've used for you know somewhere in the neighborhood now of about 58 years I've used a one inch tenth micrometer to measure case head expansion when I work up loads for any specific calibers. Always, always use that micrometer to see where I am from a pressure standpoint. Now, we've got cases that have 20 degree shoulders, we've got cases that have 17 degree 30 minute shoulders, we've got cases that have 25 degree, 30 degree, 35 degree, 40 degree, 45 degree shoulders, and one thing or another. We've got cartridge cases that have about a 45 degree shoulder, but there's a radius on on the neck and at the shoulder, as in our Weatherby line, most of all of our Weatherby line, except for two of their latest cartridges, all have radius type shoulders. It's been 
an idea that has been stated for years that the little steeper shoulder holds the volume of the powder in the case just millisecond, maybe milli, faint, faint milliseconds longer than a case with a very mild shoulder like the 17 degree 30 minute shoulder or 20 degree shoulder. What I'm saying is that that powder starts flowing up the case sooner in a milder shoulder than it does in a steeper shoulder. Now exactly what advantage this is, well it could it could have an advantage from a standpoint of peak pressure is more is more even with the steeper shoulder case than it is with the milder shoulder case because it's holding that holding that powder there just milliseconds more for basically you know closer variations closer variations in how we end up with standard deviations the way that it burns the actual pressure curve the actual pressure curve of charge of powder in relationship to the case shape we've got cases with what are considered reasonably short necks to a little bit longer necks any case that's got a neck that's one caliber long one caliber means like for instance 30 caliber 308 308 is 30 caliber you know 224 224 length so when we refer to actual neck length we're referring to a, a caliber one caliber of neck length and anyway those aspects you know are there now we've got other aspects and what I you know mentioned to do with the actual cases and other things in my video I'm gonna basically go to the other things and that is actual chamber dimensions throat dimensions throat diameters the actual length of the throat the actual full diameter of the throat before it starts to taper the lead starts to begin in the in the throat and all these various things uh, vary considerably actually can vary considerably from manufacturer to manufacturer to do with, with rifles to do with loaded ammunition and one thing and another to do with bullet seating depths and one thing another and lately we've seemed to be fed a line that you know a bullet that is seated just the length of the case but we're going to have a more accurate round than a bullet that's seating a little bit down below the neck of the case down in the capacity slightly into the shoulder area or maybe even a little bit deeper let's say down to a quarter of an inch below the neck or something like that that actually when it's fired that the bullet is bent that the bullet is bent before it actually gets to enter the bore well this is all a bunch of crap there's not a person alive that's used a high-speed x-ray camera to take a, a an x-ray picture of that bullet just as it just as the cartridge is fired to see whether it was ever bent. We've had comments over the years that undersized bullets bump up to fit the bore, the bump up to fit the groove diameter of the barrel. That's also a bunch of crap. You know how quick from the time that firing pin hits that primer and the bullet's out the barrel, it doesn't have time to bend a bullet and it sure as hell doesn't have time to expand the bullet up to a larger diameter groove. Say a 284 bullet expands up to 285. This is all nonsense. This is all speculation. It just doesn't hold any water. Nobody's ever took x-ray image of this to determine this to make these kind of a stupid damn comments. And this is part of the reason why I'm talking about some of these things talking about accuracy things I'm going to switch right into accuracy aspect 
You could have a rifle that's every bit as accurate if the bullet is seated a quarter inch below or just the depth of the neck, depending on the caliber, the situation, everything that there is. And if you want to seat bullets just the length of the neck, you have the option as a, a, a reloader, as a hand loader, as a gun maker such as myself, to throat the rifle on barrel accordingly for the specific bullets that you're going to use. This can be done. Just because a cartridge came out, like some of the latest cartridges that came out, one of the latest cartridges that came out, the 7mm PRC, the most ideal situation, well, ideal in whose, in whose mind? There has been not yet nobody to prove that this is better, or that it's worse, or that it's good, or that it's bad, or that it's indifferent. The fact of the matter is, is that it's just a bunch of talk. It's a sales gimmick to try to get you to buy this over that or something else. There's really nothing more. There's no area in actual chamberings for any caliber. There's no area for any, 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 really any additions, any improvements. We're basically doing the same thing that we did before. Tweaking the case, a different diameter case, a different length case, a shorter case, a longer case, a shorter neck, a longer neck, on and on and on and on and on. Down to actual throat diameters and one thing or another. And most all reamers, not every reamer, but most all reamers are made with the throat diameter be simply one thousandths larger in diameter than the bullet. We've got to have working tolerances. We've got to have things that work. Lately we've got, you know, so-called chambers that are not a thousandths larger, but only like about six or seven tenths larger. Well, have you ran a test? Have you ran an extensive test? A barrel chambered one way with a specific reamer, a barrel chambered the other way with a specific reamer to make any statements like this? It's just a bunch of idle gossip to get you to try and buy another product. It's all about dollars and one thing or another. You see, you've got to understand these things. And I've worked with all these aspects, continue to work with all these situations. And, you know, if we've got an individual place in a rifle order that wants a particular length of throat. As a rule, I know what throats in relationship to the available bullets that it should be. If there is a particular thing that, you know, needs to be changed just a little bit to do with the diameter, I mean the length of a bullet in relationship to the throat and the length of it, some of these things I'm able to accommodate. Some things I stay with what I know works the very, very best from many, many years of building perhaps even hundreds of hundreds of rifles in that specific chambering. I know what works. I know what doesn't work. And, you know, I know what works in relationship to actual chamber dimensions, in relationship to case diameter sizes. We don't need a chamber that's too tight in the OD for a hunting working type of a rifle. I built many bench rifles, bench rest type rifles, the tightly chambered chambers that are, cha that are tight in every aspect, tight in the body diameter, tight in the neck diameter, and everything to reduce dimensions. And I might go on to say that one of the ways to get accuracy is listening to my video on how to properly size cases. If you want accuracy, you're going to get accuracy with a properly sized case that doesn't have any play or doesn't have any slop in the in the chamber. It should be obvious that once the case is fired, if you stick with dimensions that are correct 
when you close the bolt, if you do so, according to my instructions to size the case, the case will center itself by the shoulder. Taper on the shoulder of the case, it will center itself. It won't lob, it won't lay down to the bottom. The case won't lay down to the bottom of the chamber. It will automatically center. It will be automatically lined up to the center line of the bore. These are aspects that other people don't talk about, things that I talk about, things that I know, that I've figured out, that I realize, you know. So these are the basically the other things that I'm constantly, you know, pointing out. The more that you understand these aspects, the more proficient that you'll become with some of these things. And I have figured out almost all these things through trial and error over a lifetime of being a reloader and becoming very experienced and becoming a highly experienced hand loader many, many years ago. So this is my purpose to bring these things up. And for instance, in seven millimeter, in seven millimeter cartridge offerings, We've got a, a considerably wide array of cartridge offerings. There are none of them that are bad. There are some that are maybe a little better than others. But what I consider for a hunting rifle in the West here, I want a large capacity case in 7mm or any other caliber for that matter because it's going to give me better downrange punch out there if I have to shoot something out there at four, five, six, seven hundred yards, which is about as far as anybody should be shooting. You need to be very experienced to do so to begin with. But a smaller capacity case doesn't have more because some of these things are all just basically, you know, adhered to the depth that the bullet seated, the actual, you know, case. Now, We've got a powder or powders made in every situation that we've got in the way of any caliber, any bullet weights. We have never had it better in the reloading world than we have it today with this tremendous amount of powders. Best accuracy is usually obtained with charges that fill a case nearly full say 95, 98% full, or, or maybe even more so. Maybe the bullet just touching the, the, the powder column, or maybe slightly compressed. For every cartridge that there is, we've got maybe a couple or three or four powders that are just absolutely, you know, wonderful for the situation. But out of that, there might be one, perhaps two, that stand out above the other several powders. So. I always pick a powder that's going to give me a full case if I can. And I might add a few other things, you know, many, many years ago when I was a bit younger and I had more, I had a little bit more opportunity and the time of year of hunting and one thing or another, hunting in considerably cold weather, maybe 20, 20 below zero or something like that, I did a small amount of testing with a couple of powders at the time that I was using specifically for the cartridges that I was using. And I discovered many, many years ago when I started working with the big, what I call the big sevens, the seven by 300 Winchester Improved that I designed, the seven millimeter by 300 Weatherby, my seven millimeter 404 Wapiti Express and other big K seven millimeters that I used Winchester WC860 powder in. I discovered back then that that powder was a powder designed to be able to be used at low temperatures. They used it in 50 BMGs as a military pull down powder, 50 BMG cartridges. That powder was one of our very first powders that were designed for a temperature aspect to be able to be used. We've got powders now today, you know, about 
37 or 8 years later since I first started messing around with that that are categorized as the extreme variety or very very small variations in velocities from lower from from lower temperature to higher temperature well, I discovered this in that powder many many years ago that preceded everything else that we've got that you know today as far as our line of extreme temperature stable type powders that pet powder was quite stable very little very little difference between 70 degrees and 20 below zero I don't have the exact figures in front of me anymore but if I remember it was pretty inconsequential somewhere down there around 20 to 40 feet a second difference with the low temperatures and one thing or another that's very inconsequential there were things that you know over the years that you know that I've become aware of that had just an opposite effect that there was a broad broad variation in how that powder burned between normal 70 degrees say 50 degrees 30 degrees 20 below zero so anyway this is this is the, the last of what I've got to talk about the other things so you know this gives you a little bit more rounded idea of what you're really looking at what you're really involving yourself with when you're loading ammunition all these different little aspects they all add up they all add up down the line 